Oh boy! Back in the day when I first tried to do YouTube, the first review I did was actually Super Mario Brothers. But in making videos I kept on my channel, you know, my actual seasons, the first review I did that I was proud of was Super Mario 64. And while I'm still proud of it, I do not review games like I did when I first started the channel. I used to give more personal responses in a separate video and leave the hard-hitting reviews to the Take On series. This approach was dumb. Two separate videos for an entire story? One of which was completely unscripted? Oh yeah, that worked. This is why I'm introducing the Sauron Takes On Rematch series. It is basically re-reviews on games I've already covered, but in my new format. I'm going to be doing the rematch series a lot less, I'm not going to lie. I'm also going to be explaining my history here just a tad little bit. When growing up, I originally had an NES, but most of my older memories were with the SNES. However, I remember when my cousin had an N64, and I first saw Super Mario 64. Moving around in 3D was such a weird experience that first time. Climbing trees and swimming in water was an intense experience when first playing in 3D. And between this and James Bond, I had my work cut out for me. This was also the first time I recall 100% beating a game. After getting an N64 of my own and getting a copy of Super Mario 64 that uh, I no longer own that copy. Shame, really. Still, Super Mario 64 is one of the easiest N64 games to get a hold of in this day and age. Even now, being on the Switch for a large yearly fee. Well, I don't think 50 is much. I think without a larger library, adding on and better online support, it isn't worth it. It's, it's not worth it. Maybe when they add Goldeneye, huh? Anyway, I'm rambling at this point now. This version I played and re-reviewing, it was on the Switch, actually, but it's in the Super Mario 3D All-Stars pack. So, let's do it. Let's take on Princess Peach's castle! Time for a rematch! So, the story begins and Mario gets a message from Princess Peach. For once, it isn't an SOS, rather a simple invitation for cake. Sadly, when Mario arrives, Bowser has taken over the place. Oops. He took the power starts in the castle, which possibly power the place? However, because this isn't a FNAF game, the doors are all sealed shut without power. Oh wait, that does actually sound like a FNAF game. Huh. It is up to Mario to gain the power stars back and open up the castle, taking down Bowser once more and freeing the princess. Eh, this story is relatively simple, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired. The background on the Power Stars has been mostly learned through other games. Unfortunately, Super Mario Sunshine, Galaxy, and Odyssey paint an easier to follow picture on what the deal is with these things. There's also the hint that Bowser didn't realize how many Power Stars were actually in the castle, and ended up missing some. I guess the castle is even kicking his ass, right? Still, it isn't exactly clear what stars he's unaware of. Um, is it the secret stars? Well, those include stars from his levels. Is he seriously not savvy to his own levels and the stars within him? These are gained through red coins. Does that mean he's unaware of all the red coin stars? What about secret 100 coin stars? It's impossible to say. The writing is plenty fine to motivate players into beating the game, sure. But knowing more about the worlds you travel in would be cool too. The only one really talked about is bob Battlefield. King bob is evil, and the friendly pink explosives are trying to stop him, I guess. And there's a dried-up river, which is kind of interesting. Everything else is just a few flavor texts here and there. A giant wall mad that people are using streets and walls? A wiggler mad because you punched a hole in his ceiling? Things like this. Again, things that work overall, but leave me feeling uninterested in the world around me when it comes to the events and lore. Now keep in mind, that's only the writing of these places. When it comes to look-wise, these locales look great for the N64. I love the retro feel to this game, and the locals look amazing. Okay, maybe not amazing, but for the time these graphics looked amazing and everything was interactive, which is awesome. The themes of the levels are interesting enough to make every level visually interesting, even if there isn't a whole lot of lore attached to each level. That being said, some of the objects are just 2D sprites, and the better your TV, the more dated they kinda look. But it was cool to see them not modeled everything for optimization. For its time, Super Mario 64 was a graphic marvel, and has a perfect nostalgia feeling. The music is fantastic as well. The bomb battlefield theme, as well as Dire Dire Docks, these tunes are amazing. And while the themes for the slides and Metal Mario are really fun. 
some of the other themes are more atmospheric, but they work pretty well regardless. Like, Lethal Lava's Land still enhances the level itself. Overall, this game is incredibly charming, including ba- Oh, jeez, what did they do to Bowser? Bowser, you need to visit Dr. Mario or something. <laughs> okay, not everything looks great right out of the box, but it worked for the time. Well, at least the game also looks really good in motion. Seriously, this game plays amazingly. Honestly, I cannot describe how awesome this game is. The controls are super tight, and there isn't anything Mario isn't really capable of. Let me put it to you this way. The gameplay is so open, you can probably perform actions that the developers didn't intend for you to do. Yes, you can break level designs in this game, finding shortcuts to stars that make this game fun to speedrun. Mario even has moves that are literally useless. A breakdance styled kick, a few punches, these moves aren't really as useful as jumping on foes. Mario still has them though, and the power-ups aren't anything to scoff at either. They are, however, fairly situational, and that could be an issue. Metal Mario is basically heavy and invincible to everything, which is fun but doesn't last long. There is an invisibility cap which lets you pass through certain barriers. Um, okay. The worst though is flying. Taking a page out of Sonic, the flying cap is momentum based. However, this admittedly isn't fun to control. It is super fun to fly around a stage. It is not super fun to control Mario to hit something very specific and very small like a particular coin. Mario can also gain a ton of momentum in the air, which has a tendency to swing the camera around like crazy too. However, I don't think this is a big deal. I mean, the camera I'll go back to, but the power-ups don't need to be super awesome thanks to Mario's movement capabilities. Mario can do a lot of things in this game, and this game adds everyone's favorite move, the long jump. It is a longer jump that can boost speed. You can also walk from a wall, immediately move backwards towards the wall, and jump really high. This is an awesome move too. Oh, I love the movements in this game. Not the bloody camera could keep up. Yeah, here we go. The camera was ahead of its time back in the day, but man, it has aged. Look, there were times, even as a kid, that I felt it would be easier to beat some of these challenges in real life not having to deal with the damn camera. The way they pulled it off is a free roaming camera that was basically stuck to a moving object, in this case, Lakitu. However, what happens is, is that a lot of things actually hit Lakitu. Since the camera is physically attached to an actual object, when there's another object or fencing around, Lakitu will hit these objects. Lakitu isn't also as fast as Mario. Again, normally not super issue, but when Mario is flying, Lakitu often can't keep up, especially while Mario is trying to get small, tiny objects in the air. And yeah, I know, I know. I'm complaining about getting small objects in the air when only about three or four stars have this kind of challenge. And only two or three of them have bottomless pits, so if you mess up, you die. Honestly, the levels in this game aren't that difficult, and realistically, there's little issue to any of the levels in general. There are a few stars that can be very difficult to get, but the main ones aren't super hard. There isn't too much in the main levels that are super difficult to get to. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean there aren't challenges, and there are a few regular stars I dislike, one of which is flying for small coins in the bomb Battlefield. Yeah, sure, there's not a, you know, bottomless pit, so it's not that terribly difficult, but it can still be kind of annoying. I'll also throw up the cannon challenge in Tall Tall Mountain, and Rainbow Road entirely, and finding secrets, which are just invisible spots all over the map. But overall, you don't need to collect every star. Realistically, the ones you don't like, you can skip. The only need slightly over half the stars in the game, I think? This means you can collect stars at ease, skipping most of the ones you don't like. In fact, you can get enough stars to get the final Bowser fight before ever seeing Bowser a second time. Speaking of Bowser, he has three stages all on his own. These are fun challenges for sure, leading up to a fight with Bowser. However, the fight with Bowser isn't super thrilling. All three fights are similar, but thankfully different enough to stand out enough. The rest of the boss fights are hugely disappointing though. Chain Chump is unique enough, but B King Babong? He's really super simple. No, I get it. Nintendo's first dive into 3D, they wanted players to know how to 
play grab ass with some of the boss fights. Still, way too simple. The Wiggler fight is just as bad, jumping on the bad guy. For how big he is, he's super weak Wiggler since jumping on him didn't bother them in Super Mario World. Overall, while the levels are pretty good, though regardless of the boss fights, swimming, jumping, exploring a brand new dimension, it's all relatively nice. So, if there are 70 stars that you need to get to actually beat the game, what about the other 50 stars? Overall, there's 120 stars in the game, and some of them are secret. There are ones hidden around the castle, and there's a bunch of 100 coin challenges. The ones hidden in the castle are either a hidden area or a red coin mission, most likely both. However, some of these are incredibly difficult to get. Two of them are flying missions with coins! Hooray! This is difficult due to the controls, which makes them a pain. And there's bottomless pits in this one, so one mistake can lead to certain death. The ones in the Bowser levels are grating due to the red coins being off the normal beaten path, too. Meanwhile, the 100 coin challenges can be just as frustrating. You go to a course, collect 100 coins, and BAM! A star. However, there are good things and bad things. Red coins are worth two regular coins. Blue coins are worth five coins, and yes, they're returning from Super Mario Bros. 3 with switches. However, sometimes you will almost always need to get these coins just to get up to 100 coins. And the star spawns right above Mario, so that can cause issues too. After getting all 120 coins, you end up opening up a cannon in the courtyard of the castle, the, the area that you start the game with. Using it, you can get onto the roof of the castle and meet up with Yoshi, who gives you 100 extra lives. This is fun, it's a cute little gift, but really, you've mostly explored the entire game at this point. It's not really all that useful. This can be useful to study game for speed runs, I suppose. This works and can be fun, it doesn't really do anything. At least it's better than the reward from Super Mario 64 DS. Naturally, bringing up the DS version, let's go over some of the differences here. This game has a lot of them, but I don't feel like doing a second video on this since I've already done that. First thing, the story is slightly altered. Mario, Luigi, and Wario of all people are invited to the castle, but they're all captured as well. Eventually, Yoshi comes in and saves the day, freeing the other characters and making them playable. Hooray! Yoshi can eat enemies, lay eggs, and shoot fire. None of this is particularly useful in Mario 64, but it's fun. Meanwhile, Mario can fly and inflate now? Um, yay? I know Mario inflates in Super Mario World, but that power-up is weird in that game and is just as weird here. It's only used for a certain amount of stars, however. Luigi can jump way better and break the game in half. As soon as you have Luigi, this game gets a lot easier. Luigi can also turn invisible. Wario is big and brawny, which doesn't do too much for the game, but he also turns metal and breaks these new black bricks. Wario is easily the most situational character. Anyway, with new abilities, naturally there are more stars in each level too. The game replaces a lot of the easier stars, or finding secret stars, with silver star challenges. This is actually a good thing for me. There is also a bunch of more mini levels added, and a few new boss fights like King Goomba, King Boo, and a new version of the Ice Bully. Last but not least, there are more rewards. Each character can catch colored rabbits to unlock a bunch of minigames, celebrating the touchscreen. This is one of the first DS games and they had a lot of minigames, which is fun for sure. These minigames are pretty decent overall, but some of them are kind of dumb. The worst part, however, is the minigames you get for 100% completion. Since Yoshi's playable, he isn't on the roof, right? So you get all 150 power stars and yes, there are 30 more power stars and Oh, a rabbit. It unlocks a slot game that is slightly faster than a previous slot game you already have. Huh, <laughs> neat. Also, the game controls like shit compared to the original. Using a touchscreen or a D-pad isn't as good as a joystick, and the 3DS helps but isn't great. The best version is what you can get on the Wii U, but it still feels kind of off. Overall though, I feel the DS version is easier than the original despite the awkward controls, and more stars. This version is great for beginners to the 3D collectathon platforming genre, which is awesome. Overall, Super Mario 64, while classic, hasn't aged as well as some other 3D platformers. However, the game is still good for being one of the first 3D open world platformers. Yes, Super Mario 64 gets a 7 out of 10 for me. 
As for the DS version, it is also good sitting at a 7 as well, but for different reasons. The original excels at gameplay and great level design with super charming music and graphics for the time anyway, while suffering from writing and side content. The DS also suffers from the writing in the exact same way, while also adding to the side content, then immediately taking a hit in the gameplay department. I can see why fans of the original would hate the DS version though. The original's gameplay is so dang good, people 100% this game very often despite the flaws. Hell, there are some levels that I absolutely hate and it would still blow past them for a 100% run just because controlling Mario is so damn good in the original. There's also even less reason to 100% the DS version since the final minigame is one of the worst which is kind of dumb. Oh well. I still say start with the DS version if you're a beginner to 3D platforms in general. However, the DS version is only playable on three different consoles, while the original is more readily available. Either way, while somewhat aged, Mario still brings a good time here in this game, and I do recommend trying it out if you have the chance. Either way, after this revisit, as well as a revisit to Doki Doki Literature Club, I'll head into games that I have yet to review again. Maybe Mario's blue speedy rival? We'll see. Go ahead and like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed the review, hit the bell for more updates, and subscribe because rumor has it that that button actually does something. <laughs> Until next time, my minions, take care. <laughs>